understood uh, representations of n as a sum of two squares through the Gaussian integers, where i to the fourth is 1. Okay, I'm just reminding you for a second. The way that we, we came to this question about what numbers are sum to two squares, which numbers have representations of the sum of the two squares, from the Pythagorean question, and very quickly realized we should be doing things in the Gaussian integers. What made the Gaussian integer special is that uh, the number i satisfies i to the fourth is 1. So as a review and a slightly deeper re-understanding of what we did, so quote unquote review in the sense that it's brand new, but it's going to go exactly the same way, what happens, what happens for not this equation, not x to the fourth equals one, i solves this equation, but for w or omega is a solution to x cubed equals one. Let's try to understand this, okay? So we have this equation, so look at, look at the equation x cubed minus one equals zero. Anybody know what the solutions to this are? Karen? One. One is definitely a solution. So that means we can factor out an x minus one. And what's left over? Devendra? Uh, yes. Um, say that same answer again in, in two minutes. Sheik? Is it x squared plus x plus one? Perfect. And now let's apply the quadratic formula. So this, this gives us that solution. This quadratic formula all together, negative one plus or minus square root of b squared is one minus four ac is one all over two, two times one, okay? So in other words, this is negative a half plus or minus square root of negative three over two, root three over two i. And now let's understand why Devendra said what he said. Where are these three points geometrically? So remember i, the solutions to x to the fourth equals one are over here. i to the fourth is one, one to the fourth is one. What else solves x to the fourth is one? Negative one to the fourth is one. Drew, you were saying it? Negative i. Negative i. And negative i, right? Because because if we look at um, x to the fourth minus one, that factors as x squared minus one times x squared plus one, and this factors even further as x plus one times x minus one times this factor. So here's our solution of one. Here's our solution of negative one, and these are the two i and negative i solutions. Okay. How about here? Where is this geometrically? So let's look in the complex plane. We have this solution, x equals one is here. So this is one. So this was one i, negative one, negative i. Here's one, negative a half plus root three over two i is over here somewhere. And negative a half minus root three over two i is over here somewhere. And what's the length of this vector? Other than dimension. The length of this vector? What is it? The norm. The norm? Yes, the norm. Okay, let's work out the norm. So what is the norm of negative a half, let's say, plus root 3 over 2i? That's negative a half plus root 3 over 2i times negative a half minus root 3 over 2i. Negative a half times negative a half? A quarter. Uh, minus i squared is a plus, root 3 over 2 squared, 3 quarters is 
one. So these three points all lie on a unit circle, just like these four points all lie on a unit circle. And in fact, these three points, so this, this solution is x is equal to e to the um, 0 times 2 pi i over 3. And Dipendro told us what these solutions are. x is equal to e to the plus or minus 2 pi i over 3. What is this angle? Forty. If, if it looks like 45, I drew it poorly. Think about what this is. This is a half, and this is root 3 over 2. 60. 60. We have a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Okay? So this, this angle is 60 degrees, which is pi over 3. So this angle is 2 pi over 3. Uh, sorry. What am I saying? Uh, yeah, that's right. This is 2 pi over 3. This is another 2 pi over 3. And that's another 2 pi over 3. So this is a third of the way around the unit circle, another third of the way, and another third of the way. That's because they're all numbers that, when cubed, give you 1. Because e to the 2 pi i is e to the 2 pi i is 1. e to the 2 pi i is altogether 1. OK? So does everyone see this kind of? how this geometry is somewhat similar to the geometry there. These numbers, what's, what's similar to all of those four numbers? They're, they're of the form, what is, e, what is uh, e to the 2 pi i over 4 instead of over 3? It's not going to be 1. E to the 2 pi i over 4 is I, because it's exactly going a quarter of the circle around. E to the 2 pi i is, well, e to the 2 pi, e to the 2 pi i is all the way around the circle. You're back to 1. So e to the 2 pi over 4 is a quarter of the way around the circle, and you're at i. And if you follow another quarter, that would get you e to the twice 2 pi i over 4. That's e to the pi i, which is negative 1. And then another quarter circle gets you to the minus side, and another quarter circle gets you back it up. Okay? So this is starting to look very much very similar. So let's look at ex exercise one. Exercise one. Z adjoin omega is a ring. Omega is this solution. This this point is omega. Where omega is um, negative a half plus root three over two i. I'm just arbitrarily choosing one of these two roots. It's also equal to e to the two pi i over three. Okay, prove that this is a ring. That was the first thing we did with the Gaussian integers. We observed that it was a ring. So what does this mean, z adjoin i, z adjoin omega? So it's all polynomial, yeah, Benjo? Say it again? Yeah, so, so what is this? At first, this is all polynomials. So there's a0 plus a1 omega plus a2 omega squared plus a3 omega cubed, and so on. So this means finite polynomials, a n omega to the n. This is the set of all things that look like this where the a, j's are all integers. That's what this notation means. It means polynomials in omega. Now, Dipendro is saying that's the same thing as just linear polynomials, a0 plus a1 omega. And the question is, why is that true? Sarah? Because ultimately, like, all of your numbers collapsed either the reals and the imaginary. Um, very close. It is absolutely true that all the numbers collapse. In this case, it's not, it doesn't divide as cleanly as before into the reals and the imaginaries. It does divide into the reals and the omega multiples. But why? What do we know about omega squared? 
This is because, if you remember when we, when we uh, first looked at rings, I told you study linear polynomials and show that the set of linear polynomials does not form a ring. Because when you multiply two linear polynomials, you get a quadratic term. <coughs> right? But what happens here, remember that W is a solution to this equation. W solves, W is not 1, so it doesn't solve this equation, it solves this equation. x squared plus x plus 1 equals 0. So what do we know about W squared? W is a root of this equation, which means when I stick in W for x, I get 0. So what do I know about W squared? Negative W uh, no, minus, one. minus 1 to the other side. Negative W minus 1. Let's see if we can see that in the complex plane. So W, remember W is rotate by 2 pi over 3. So we start at 1. We rotate by 2 pi over 3, we get this w here. Really it's omega, but you guys don't like weird Greek letters, so I'll keep calling it w. But I'll keep writing omega. Maybe you don't know the difference. And then never mind. So this is 2 pi over 3 rotation. What's w squared? Do it again. Rotate by another 2 pi over 3, right? w squared is this other root. Maybe I should have written this as 4 pi i over 3 instead of negative 2 pi over 3. Same thing. So w squared is over here. w squared. It's that other root. w squared is the conjugate of w. Complex conjugate. Does everybody see that? It's this other root. It's the thing with the minus sign here instead of a plus sign. So the claim is that w squared is negative w. So what's negative w? Yeah, negative w is reflect across, just switch the vector from that direction to the, the other direction. So negative w is over here. This is negative w minus 1. So w squared is negative w minus 1. Okay? So it's like working I don't know how much I don't know how much algebra you guys have had, but this ring z adjoined w is the same thing as just an abstract ring z adjoined x of all polynomials mod out by the ideal generated by x squared plus x plus one, which means okay, never mind if you don't know what this what this what these symbols mean. They mean any time you see x squared plus x plus one, you can replace that by zero. And the beautiful thing is that that's equivalent to any time you see an x squared, you're going to replace it by negative x minus 1. And so arbitrary polynomials, if you see a w, there's nothing you can do about it. If you see a w squared, it drops back down to a linear term in w. Every time you see a w squared, it drops down to a linear. Does that make sense? So this is why uh, working in this abstract, this is one reason, it's the beginning of why working in this abstract setting rather than following through these exact complex uh, arithmetic, starts to be more natural. Maybe for you at the moment, working with these things ex explicitly feels more natural, and that's okay. Okay, so, um, so exercise one, this is a ring. I mean, I basically proved it for you, but uh, prove it again, make sure you understand what, what that means. So what is Z adjoined W? So what is, a so question, what is Z adjoined W as a subset of the complex numbers? Assuming you've done this exercise and, and you see that it's just some integer plus an integer multiple of W, in the complex numbers, let's make this a little bit bigger, where are we? So we certainly have, so this is anything of the form A plus B omega. Any element in here looks like a plus b omega. So how about 0, 0? That gives us the origin. The origin is in How about 1, 0? That gives us the point 1. 
How about zero one? I is a good guess, except it's not I. Uh, zero one is just omega. So omega is over here somewhere. It's on the unit circle, but it's at a, this is a 60 or a 30 degree angle. Okay, so far so good. What else do we have? Well, we have two and we have negative one. Let's set B equal to zero. We have all the integers, two, three, uh, let's be a little careful. This, this is a half. This distance on the x-axis, you remember what, what W is? Omega is negative a half. So this distance is, is negative a half. This is negative one. This is negative two. This is negative three. What else do we have? Negative omega. Negative omega. Negative omega, we already said was down here. Negative omega. Well, are you saying that we also have a point negative a half, or that's just no, just no, no? We don't have. This is not a point. This is just the distance. Okay, yeah, yeah. The distance here is is halfway to, from zero to one. What else? Charles. Two omega. Two omega. Where is two omega? Yeah, it's it's twice. Two omega is going to be over here. Um, let's see. Two omega. Where is it exactly? It's at negative one plus root three i. So negative one plus root three i is over here at two omega. Interesting. What else do we have? Alex? Do we have omega squared? Omega squared. Where's omega squared? Now, we don't have omega squared here, but omega squared is an instance of this at negative one, negative one. Negative one minus omega is omega squared. So we do have omega squared. <coughs> and we already know where that is. It's down here. Omega squared, same thing as negative one minus omega. Right? Negative one minus omega. This is minus omega. This is the vector minus omega. Negative one says go here. Minus omega gets you this point, which is also omega squared. What else? Al, uh, Will. Uh, so we have uh, negative omega squared. Set it up. Yep, negative, negative omega squared, which is also omega plus one. We also have omega plus two, and omega plus three, and omega minus one, and omega minus two. Anybody see what's going on yet? Yeah. What's going on? Lattice points? Yes, what kind of lattice? Yes, it's a triangular lattice. It's often called a hexagonal lattice, unfortunately, although it is made up of, of these equilateral triangles. So it's the equilateral triangular lattice. You see why it's called a hexagonal lattice. There's your hexagon. It's the hexagonal packing of, of the plane. This is four. Uh, this is the next halfway point. Here's your hexagons and the triangles that break up those hexagons. Gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, good. Okay, so this is this is the hexagonal lattice in the plane. Cool. Charles. Why is it a hexagon and not a plane? Like oh, yeah. There's a million different ways of seeing. So somebody said triangular lattice. Um, Charles is pointing out it's also this parallelogram lattice. It's basically a polygon. Yeah. Um, the name of this thing traditionally is the hexagonal lattice for kind of silly traditional reasons. Yeah, if you want to call it a triangular lattice or a parallelogram lattice, this, this is the name you'll find in the literature for this, this lattice, Z adjoin I. It also has a name, by the way. These are called the Eisenstein energy. Eisenstein integers. Just like Z adjoin I is called the Gaussian integers. Eisenstein was the first two. Uh, well, he proved cubic reciprocity where Gauss proved quadratic reciprocity and couldn't figure out what cubic reciprocity was. We haven't gotten there yet, so I don't expect you to know what, what that means. Um, but we will. Maybe. Depending on, on how much time we have. Um, the reason this, so we're kind of going backwards. 
we had figured out all of this stuff because we were interested in values of quadratic form, x squared plus y squared. That was the norm form in the Gaussian integers. So what is the norm form in the Eisenstein integers? Question, what is the norm form, norm form for the Eisenstein integers? What, what does that mean? How did we get to x squared plus y squared? We took the norm of x plus i y. So what's the norm form here? What's the norm of a plus b omega? What should that mean? Is it a plus b omega times a minus b omega? Other than Dependro? Dependro? Yes. I want the absolute value squared of this number. I want this to be, um, if, if I just do, I'm multiplying this by not its complex conjugate if I put a minus sign here and not a bar here. I'm multiplying it by something else. This is the thing that I need in order to get a real number. And, that, and, a, and a positive real number. I mean, unless, unless it's the zero vector. Okay? So, take two minutes now, work out what this is. Go. What is this? as a function of a and b. Remember, a and b are integers. This is a and b are integers. What is G. that? No, what is that dash for? Oh, this dash? Yeah. So this is the complex conjugate. So the oh, complex oh, conjugate oh. of omega is omega squared. Oh, okay. In fact, that will be useful in this computation. So take five minutes and work out what this is. And give me a thumbs up when you've got it. It's going to be some quadratic form in A and B. And we can understand the values, bless you, of that quadratic form. And we can understand how to find representations of primes as long as they satisfy certain correct congruences using this point of view. So I think we're going to very quickly redo the entire theory that we did over the Gaussian integers for x squared plus y squared for this norm form. This is our next quadratic form of study. So give me a thumbs up when you have it. Was that a thumbs up? Oh. You should just have uh, something that looks like a polynomial, quadratic homogeneous polynomial in A and B with integer coefficients. Yes. Um, what is the complex conjugate? What why is the complex? Is it, why is it? W? Okay. Um, so this is so w squared. Let's see. Aside. Aside. W squared. W is e to the two pi i over three. So w squared. Let, let's put that in. Two pi i over three squared. So this is e to the 4 pi i over 3. And e to something, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this is cosine of 4 pi over 3 plus i sine of 4 pi over 3. And that is exactly this point. And sine, so cosine of 4 pi over 3 is negative a half sine of 4 pi over 3 is negative root 3 over 2. So this is plus i times negative root 3 over 2. And the original w was negative a half plus root 3 over 2 i up here. So a complex conjugate is just changing the i. Um, so you just take the i and flip the positive. Yep. Okay. So a complex conjugate is always reflection across the x-axis. Okay. Whereas that's what we thought well, the right thing to do is take the complex conjugate. The wrong thing to do is take a minus w here. Because minus w is not the complex conjugate of w. Does that work for i, but not for Yes, it works for i. 
but not for w. Because i is already on the y-axis, so you flip it, you get negative i. Everybody got it yet? Who has it? Give me a show of hands. OK. And what's the answer? Uh, Will? A squared. A squared plus B squared. Minus AB. Minus AB. Minus AB. So what numbers are expressible? So the question we should be able to answer with this technology, so main question, what <laughs> integers are represented by the quadratic form in x and y. It used to be x squared plus y squared. Now it's x squared plus y squared minus xy. Now we have a new quadratic form, x squared minus xy plus y squared. And what norms, what norms arise what norms of Eisenstein integers, what, what integers are norms of Eisenstein integers? Will explain to us, it's the same question as what integers are represented by this quadratic form, instead of x squared plus y squared. Does everybody see that? Devendra? Any questions? Al? Can you work through the, the norm computation? Of yes, let's do the norm computation. Uh, should I make it an exercise? No, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Um, answer, okay, so answer. Um, a plus B omega times A plus B. Now, o omega bar, all right, let's leave it omega bar for a second. Um, yeah, let's leave it omega bar just for a second and then we'll see what's going on. So we definitely have an A squared. We definitely have a B omega times B omega bar. The absolute value of omega is yeah, what is it? What's the length of omega? Uh, one. one. Yeah, that's the other reason this is sometimes called a hexagonal lattice. How many points are on this unit circle? Six points on the unit circle. Okay, so there's your A. So these two make an A squared, these two make a B squared. What's left over is an AB omega bar and an AB omega. So that there's an AB omega plus omega bar. But what is omega bar? Omega bar is negative one minus omega. So this is omega plus negative one minus omega, also known as negative one. So that's, that's your negative sign here. Okay, does everybody see that? So if you, if you didn't, uh, now, Hopefully, again, this shows uh, how nice it is to think algebraically instead of writing this as negative a half plus root three over two i, and this is negative a half minus root three over two i, and then multiplying all this together and combining the real parts and the imaginary parts, it'd be a big mess. But if you do this kind of very abstractly, it comes out very clean, okay? Does that make sense? Uh, I can't make this an exercise because I did it for you already. I guess I can still make it an exercise. Can I make this an exercise? Sure. Sure, because all you have to do is copy it down. I, I think, yes? Yeah. Sheik wants it tonight as an exercise. Anybody second? Sure. Yes? Okay, okay, good. Exercise two. Uh, so let's make it here. Exercise two. Exercise two, for which you already have the answer. But you know what? It's good to do the exercise because it's good to think about. So prove, prove this. Why is omega times omega bar one? Um, why is omega times omega bar one? Because omega times omega bar is the absolute value of omega squared as a complex number. And what is that complex number? So omega is here, omega bar is here. You multiply these two together. This one's rotating by pi over by 2 pi over 3. This one's rotating by 2 pi over 4. 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi over 4 is 6 2 pi over 3's. Sorry. Um, I'm, 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 
This is 2 pi over 3. This is 4 pi over 3. You, add, you multiply those together, you get 6 pi over 3, which is 2 pi by itself, so you're back to 1. Alternatively, just this length is 1. This is the uh, half root 3 over 2, 1 triangle, 30, 60, 90 triangle. So this length is 1. This length is 1. OK? Or just write it out as complex numbers, do the multiplication. That's actually what we did uh, right here. What's its norm? That's this times this, and that's the absolute value of omega. This is omega times omega bar. OK. Um, good. Now, in order to answer this question, we needed to do, what do we need in the, what was the key thing in the Gaussian integers that made it possible to have unique factorization? Division. division algorithm. So, do we have a division algorithm? So, in order to answer this main question, we need, if it exists, so question, do we have a division division algorithm? And this is important enough that I should capitalize. Take five minutes and think about the answer. In fact, does anybody know the answer already? Can anyone see the answer? The Pendro? Uh, give me a thumbs up if you think the answer is yes, we do have a division algorithm. Thumbs down if you think we don't have a division algorithm. Thumb up, thumb up, thumb up. We got a lot of thumbs up. Why, why are you saying thumbs up? Um, Karen, why are you saying thumbs up? If you remember, we don't have a division algorithm in zia join root minus 5. What went wrong with zia join root minus 5? Yeah, the lattice was too sparse. You did not have, within a, within a ball of size 1, you were, you were not able to cover the entire complex plane by balls of size 1 around the lattice points. So already we should see that ball of size 1 around all the lattice points will be more than sufficient to cover the entire complex plane. And that is what will be responsible for this division algorithm. So let me make this an exercise. This is a real test of. Um, do you understand how the division algorithm worked in the Gaussian integers? So exercise three, this is real now. Exercise three. Prove that for all n and m in the Eisenstein integers, m not zero, there exist q and r in the Eisenstein integers such that n is equal to mq plus r. And what's the next thing I'm going to write down? Yes, and the, and the norm of r is strictly less than the norm of m. How are you going to prove this? How are you going to solve this? How are you going to prove this theorem? Look at n over m. Multiply by, so that'll be some point in the complex plane. And you find a closest lattice point q. By looking at the geometry, you see that the farthest you could be from the three lattice points is somewhere here in the middle. Compute this distance. What's the worst distance you could have to a nearby lattice point q? Multiply back by m and see how big r has to be. And, and this distance is strictly less than 1. And that's what makes this inequality happen. So go back to our proof. If you have any trouble doing this without going back to notes, go back to our proof of the division algorithm in the, in the Gaussian integers and mimic that. But try to do it without using your notes. Try to see if you can really, based on what you already understand, get a Euclidean, get a division algorithm in the Eisenstein integers. What we'll do next time is, given this uh, division algorithm, we'll reprove that we have a Euclidean algorithm. We'll look at 
In fact, uh, we'll look at what ideals are generated by elements of this ring to prove that this ring is also a principal ideal domain from which we will prove unique factorization from which we will be able to tell what numbers, first what primes and then in general what numbers can be represented by this quadratic form. 